Greetings everyone, I'm Adam Harriton. In this video, I'm going to share with you some of my recent thoughts and questions on the fascinating topic of invasive species. My questions are directed specifically to those of us who consider ourselves to be native species enthusiasts. There are a lot of us in this space, and there are a lot of organizations doing great work. What I've noticed over the years though is that people in this space generally have good intentions, but our words don't always align with our actions, we say things that aren't deeply considered, and we often operate emotionally rather than rationally. If we want to make our arguments stronger, if we want people to take our native species enthusiasm seriously, we have to think deeply about our thoughts, and we have to be willing to question our beliefs, which is not easy to do. And we also have to practice what we preach. I understand that a video like this could trigger some people, that's not my intention. I'm simply trying to bring more consistency between what we say and what we do. So let's start with blaming. One thing I've observed over and over again is that blame is being placed on the wrong thing. Yes, you can hate an invasive plant. You can hate an invasive tree. You can hate an invasive insect. That's your right as a human, but I'm telling you, this kind of animosity is misdirected. And if you let it build up inside you, it can lead to all kinds of personal health problems. In many cases, the problem isn't the invasive species. The problem is the habitat, and more specifically, what's been done to the habitat. The appearance of invasive species usually coincides with some kind of major change to the landscape. This could be a cleared forest, it could be a drained wetland, it could be a mined hillside. Once the change occurs, early successional species, including those that are considered invasive, move in. It's almost inevitable in the 21st century. For some reason though, we tend to only see and treat the symptom and not the cause. Even worse, our treatment sometimes proves disastrous, and if you don't believe me, look into the history of lead arsenate. This obsession with treating the symptom and not the cause isn't unique to how we deal with invasive species. There are many parallels with how we treat our bodies. Think of something like chronic stomach pain. We could treat chronic stomach pain with pills, we could treat chronic stomach pain with Pepto-Bismol, or we could ignore the pain completely, or we could look into our diet understand that the pain is trying to grab our attention, maybe we could get rid of all rancid vegetable oils and figure out what's actually causing the problem. And it might even be stress. But few people are willing to do this kind of work because it's work. It's hard work. It's a whole lot easier to take a pill than it is to change our diet and lifestyle. Likewise, it's a lot easier to blame a plant or an insect than it is to confront a developer who's converting a 200 acre forest into a housing plan. What is most needed in these instances is not a demonization of the invaders that eventually show up around the periphery, but a good hard look at what could inspire someone to be more interested in money than wild spaces. Another inconsistency I see among people who strongly advocate for native species involves something that a lot of us probably don't want to hear, but I'll say it anyway, travel. If we want the luxury to be able to go anywhere that we wanna go and live anywhere that we wanna live, how can we keep that right to ourselves and not extend it to other living organisms? We want the luxury to be able to visit or even to settle down permanently somewhere else, but we don't want the same for others. Now, I'm not saying travel is a bad thing. I travel, but I also understand that, number one, my ability to travel anywhere that I wanna go shouldn't be exclusive to the human species, and number two, travel is associated with the movement of living organisms around the world. I accept that. I guess you could call me complicit because I travel. Now it's true, humans have been traveling ever since there were humans on this planet. But for the vast majority of time, major limitations were firmly established. We could not travel from Japan to Pittsburgh in 15 hours. Today we can do that and it's amazing, but there are consequences. Along the same lines, if we truly, truly wanted to curb the spread of invasive species, wouldn't we confront, or at least move in the direction of confronting, globalization and intercontinental trade? Now I know it's a wonderful thing to have food and clothing and computers and medicines and building materials produced someplace far away and shipped to us, but isn't there a consequence to that? And isn't one of the consequences the spread of living organisms? If we are not willing to give up our coffee from Indonesia, our phones from China, our clothes from Bangladesh, and our pharmaceuticals from Europe, we have to understand that our dependence on worldly products is directly linked 
to the spread of living organisms. We can't have one without the other, at least not in the 21st century. To me, it's kind of ironic that some people denigrate invasive species and don't think twice about supporting a company like Amazon. I don't think Amazon is a devil, but I also don't see how Amazon is really that different from any invasive species. The parallels are uncanny, and it's funny because we're so quick to smash every spotted lanternfly we see, yet we welcome with open arms our Amazon packages that wait for us outside our front door. But should we? I am not saying that globalization is inherently a bad thing. I am living proof of its benefits. But I also recognize that there is a strong connection between my reliance on worldly products, clothing, computers, building materials, food, and the movement of living organisms around the world. Speaking of food, let's shift gears for a minute and discuss a popular claim regarding the nutritional value of invasive plants for wildlife. Research has shown that the flowers and fruits of some invasive species are less nutritionally favorable for insects and birds compared to the flowers and fruits of native plants. The key word here is some. Some invasive species have been studied, and actually most invasive species have never been studied, so we have no idea how they compare to native plants. Yet a lot, and I mean a lot of people, make the claim that every invasive plant robs native pollinators and birds of important nutrients. But the major inconsistency with the sentiment that few people ever seem to realize is that if we truly believe that invasive, and by extension non-native species, are nutritionally inferior, why don't we apply this concern to our own diets? The average human diet in North America comprises non-native species, both non-native plants and animals. Aren't we concerned that our own non-native diets are nutritionally poor? Should we not be moving towards a 100% native species diet for ourselves if we truly feel like that's the best diet for living organisms? This all reminds me of a verse from Song of Songs in which it says, they made me take care of the vineyards, my own vineyard I have neglected. I think there's a beautiful parallel between these words and our concern for the diets of wild animals. Yes, it's very noble to show concern for our wild friends, but do you have that same kind of concern for yourself? And are you acting on that concern? Are you taking care of your health? Are you eating a biologically appropriate diet? Or are you neglecting your vineyard? If you are neglecting it, how can you know what's best for another living organism? Take care of the ecosystem inside of you, and you will be much better equipped to care for the ecosystem outside of you. To conclude our discussion, let's go back to the year 1492, a year that many of us in North America generally recognize as being the cutoff for when a certain organism could claim native status. Now, I think many of us in the native species community forget that in the 1400s and well before then, there were people, lots of people, on this continent who were actively working the land. And we forget or we just don't realize that the land looked the way that it did to European newcomers, not because it was untouched, but because it was touched. I'll say that again. The land looked the way that it did, not because it was untouched, but because it was touched. Indigenous cultures significantly impacted the land. Those two variables were not independent. They were intimately dependent upon one another. Here's the problem today. Many native species enthusiasts pick and choose what they want from the 15th century. They tend to focus all their attention on the native flora and fauna and completely overlook the native cultures that were entwined with the native flora and fauna. That's a huge oversight. If we like the notion of how the land looked in 1492, and we want to recreate some semblance of that today, how is it even possible to do that without acknowledging and advocating for the people who were responsible for the way the land looked? You can probably see that there are no easy answers, and at the risk of confusing myself and maybe you even more, I'm going to ask and end with one more question. Why does the land look the way that it does today? I would say the land looks the way that it does because we don't need it. Now, of course, we couldn't exist without the land. So deep down, certainly we need it. But I'm talking about consciously needing the land. Most people today in North America consciously do not need the land. And it shows, like a mirror, 
The land, in my opinion, is a perfect mirror. It reflects back to us our priorities. If we don't need or prioritize the land, things appear out of place, things seem unstable, things seem bleak. But imagine if we did need the land. Imagine if we consciously needed its food, if we consciously needed its medicine, if we consciously needed its building materials, if we consciously needed its companionship. And imagine if we acted on those needs. Couldn't we significantly change things around? Could we not turn this land into a paradise? I would say this is not only possible, I would say this is almost guaranteed if we consciously needed the land. Those are my thoughts today. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to support the work that I do, there are two ways you could do that. You could subscribe to the Learn Your Land YouTube channel. I would also love it if you would head on over to learnyourland.com and sign up for the email newsletter. Thank you so much for watching this video. I'll see you on the next one.